Hello, and welcome to the Lancaster Hi-Fi YouTube channel. Today I want to show you a project that I'm finishing up after a long-awaited parts order. Specifically, I got some capacitors to replace the electrolytic capacitors in the motor here, and I will show you some stills of that because I don't want to take it back apart. Now the service manual doesn't provide really any guidance whatsoever in servicing this motor. Here's how the motor is represented in the schematic diagram in the service manual. Note that it has a box around it and says underneath, not serviceable. It does at least show some discrete components and values. For example, 150K resistor, 470 ohm, 50, 50, something like that, 50 volt capacitor. But those components are not listed in the electrical parts list. The only thing in the electrical parts list is M2 DC motor MKL 15B. It's odd that the service manual doesn't talk about servicing the motor because it is accessible. This plastic cover comes off relatively easily. Obviously one wants to be careful not to break those tabs, but it comes off that easily. Voila. Access to the other side of the circuit board is relatively straightforward. You simply have to desolder these pins here. Now you'll see that there's some different color on there where I've added some varnish because the traces are a bit fragile. As with all circuit boards, but this one particularly, you got to watch out when you're desoldering not to damage the traces, at least not irretrievably. I did manage to slightly damage some of these traces in here and so on, but it's, it's fine. For example, on this one, a little bit of the pad was ripped off, so I simply scraped the covering off of the copper a little bit further on to allow for a good connection and plenty of solder there. And then once these pins are desoldered, this simply lifts off and you have access to the other side and, and that's pretty straightforward. Access to the innards of the stator and rotor are gained simply by removing these three screws, lifting off that cap and pulling off, despite some resistance, pulling off the, I don't know if it's the stator or the rotor, And then you can clean out where the spindle turns and put in a few drops of fresh oil, in this case, 20 weight, three in one oil to make sure that it spins nicely. So I've replaced the capacitors on that board. Those that required axial leads, I've replaced with axial leads. There were a couple of other little miniature aluminum electrolytic capacitors that I replaced as well. All of the aluminum electrolytic capacitors were replaced there. The biggest change to the look of the turntable was on the plinth here. I peeled off the old vinyl and replaced that old nasty vinyl veneer with real cherry veneer. And then I finished that with, simply with linseed oil, in this case pure raw linseed oil, food grade. I think I got this on Amazon. and. It's easily obtainable there still, I believe. Underneath, so I've replaced the power supply electrolytic capacitors. I've treated the speed adjustment pots here. There were also a couple of variable resistors on the motor board that I also treated. In addition to replacing those capacitors and treating those pots, I've done some repairs
filters and lubing in here. In particular, a neat little switch here. And there are a few turntables that have this feature where they've essentially got a muting switch so that when the needle touches down, it doesn't make a loud sound, that the sound only engages after the needle touches down. And that's controlled with, uh, there's a cam here, and that controls this little switch here. A little piece of plastic that was required had broken off. I fixed that by building up a mound of varnish there. The other thing I've done is simply add some mass to this plinth by gluing in pieces of hardwood. In general, a, ma a more massive plinth is a more stable plinth and a deader plinth. You want a dead plinth. In this case, especially because this is not a suspension mounted plinth or, or turntable as with some of the Pioneers, like my Pioneer PL630, which has a suspension system. This does not. So in this case, especially the added mass helps in terms of dampening external vibrations. At some point when I was working on this, I tilted the table up and forgot to take off the platter. The platter fell and hit the armrest here and broke it. Rather than glue it and make a messy, glued, nasty armrest, I decided to turn that deficit into an asset and hand carved a piece of cherry and hand bent a piece of heavy gauge copper wire to serve as a clip for the tone arm. I got a brand new dust cover from J&B Audio, I believe it is. I sent them a drawing with precise measurements and they made this for me. I believe the cost is something like $130, so they're not cheap, but they are very well made. It's a pleasure to work with those guys, or I think with that guy, <laughs> I dealt with one guy. Here's the under plate, or the metal part of the under plate. Uh, it had some rust, which I removed. And then I repainted the whole thing with black Rust-Oleum and repainted the part that had been rusted and where I removed the rust on the top side of the underplate. The original feet were missing, so I've added these little pointy feet. They've got a piece of butyl rubber between them and the body for a little bit of extra vibration isolation. In general, however, this is the sort of turntable that you would want to put on a well-isolated shelf. Let's see, I think I am ready to put this thing back together. I might do a little bit of testing of these pots to see whether they might benefit from a little bit more treatment. Previously, I'd been using this turntable while I waited for the new capacitors, waited for the new oil. I'd still been using it but especially for 45s, it was kind of hopeless in terms of speed stability. I'm assuming due to issues with the speed adjustment controls. I've retreated those, but I want to hook those up to a voltmeter and make sure that they don't have any iffy spots in them. What can happen is you can get pitting or damage at the exact place where you need the pot to be. And so it can be fine everywhere except where you want it.
Got boy and dog playing overhead. So pardon the noise. So I gave a lot of attention to these pots. But I think what's screwing up the speed is the switch. And I didn't give any attention to the switch. I think this is just an either or switch. That is, it's yeah, one speed selected, it's out, and the other speed selected, it's in. It might be worth simply replacing it. I think I do actually have a switch with which I could replace it. That particular switch wasn't right for that particular switch wasn't right for what I needed it for. It was one of these switches that needed a... It was a switch, I believe, that needed to operate with the tone arm and therefore require very little force to actuate. It required a little more force than I wanted for that purpose. This one, I think it would be just fine with since it's a manually operated switch. The other option would be to take apart the switch and, and service it inside it. Oh, I also found the bit in the service manual that talks about servicing the motor. It's under speed adjustment. Note, the DC motor assembly is precision assembled and adjusted at the factory. Never try to adjust and or repair. Should the motor be defective, replace entire motor assembly. They say that after they give instructions for adjusting the variable resistors on it, as I was just doing. By spraying some deoxid into the switch and then going at the contacts with this 2000 grit sandpaper, I was able to get the resistance when closed. You want essentially zero resistance when the switch is closed, but it had been anywhere from 20 to 100 or even more ohms when closed on either side. And now I've got it down to essentially zero, the resistance of the leads. Given that this one was that cruddy, I suspect that these other switches over here, which look to be of exactly the same type, are also cruddy. And while they don't necessarily appear to be affecting the mechanism or the operation of the mechanism, etc. They may be having an effect nonetheless, especially in order to ensure the long-term operability of the turntable. I need to take these apart and clean those as well. <laughs> kind of a bit of a bummer because it's a pain in the butt. What I will try to do is take the switches apart and clean them without detaching the wires. The detaching of the wires is really the most destructive and difficult part. The rest of it's just fiddly, so.
The first time through Sunday Bloody Sunday was with the Fisher Stereo Control Amplifier. It's model number CC3000, part of the Studio Standard by Fisher series. Very nice preamp. I originally bought it for a friend, but I've been kind of trying to talk him out of 
actually buying it from me after I restored it. It's one of the only preamps I have. Well, it's really the only good preamp I have that works entirely. And it also has two different phono inputs. So I can switch between turntables if I desire to do so. He has an NAD, not this particular model of NAD. I think it's the 3220 classic NAD amplifier. I also made this amplifier for him and he's coming to get it. And so I wanted to have it set up in my test rig so that he could hear what it sounds like through the preamp of the NAD, since I think that's what he ought to do in his home system. He doesn't need a separate preamp with all these bells and whistles that can drive two turntables at the same time. He's got a perfectly good NAD amplifier with its own phono preamp, and so I wanted to be able to demonstrate that for him when he comes. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this look inside and out, and of course I'll listen to the Realistic Lab 400. Beautiful old turntable, especially now that I've prettied it up quite a bit and a very good sounding turntable.